All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ashish John. I'm a professor and dean of the School of Public Health uh, here at Brown University. And I am really thrilled to welcome all of you to what I think will be a really important, productive, uh, uh, impactful conversation over the next hour. And let me very quickly introduce the two people who will be joining me in this discussion. Um, the, the first is the moderator for today's discussion, Helen Branswell. And by the way, neither of these two people, if you've been paying any attention to COVID, neither of them requires any introduction, but I'll give you very quick ones. Uh, Helen is a senior writer at STAT and has been covering infectious diseases and global health for a long time. Uh, she's the 2020 winner of the Polk Award for Public Service uh, for her coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic, wrote really from early in the pandemic, uh, has been a the, the arguably the leading voice on this topic. Uh, and so really thrilled that Helen will be moderating this discussion. And joining me in the conversation uh, along with Helen is Paul Offit. Dr. Offit uh, is an infectious disease physician, uh, pediatrician at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, he's a director of the Vaccine Education Center and really one of the leading virologists and immunologists in the world, uh, thinking about and working on issues of vaccines. Uh, and immunology in children and adults, but but with a lot of it focused on kids uh, for uh, for a long period of time, and one, really one of the key voices in this pandemic. So I am going to turn it over to Helen to lead us on in this discussion uh, about the Delta variant, where we are right now as a country, uh, as a world, and what we need to do to get through the weeks and months and maybe years ahead. So Helen, to you. Hi, Ashish. Hi, Paul. Thanks for inviting me to do this. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Uh, just a reminder to the people who are listening, we're eager to take your questions and please put them in the Q&A and, uh, and let's get going. Um, Ashish, I remember either seeing you on television or reading you somewhere in around May or June, talking really optimistically about where the country was and, you know, barbecue, planning barbecues for the summer and, um, you know, looking, sounding really hopeful. Um, and I, th I think, I, I'm, I'm curious to if, hear how you feel about things right now. Yeah. I'm reminded, thank you, Helen, I'm reminded of- I you. didn't mean to make that painful, but- <laughs> No, I'm reminded of the old Yogi Berraism of predictions are hard, particularly about the future. Uh, <laughs> so I was really optimistic in, in, I would say by March, I was feeling a, a dose of optimism that grew through May. And, um, you know, and if, you, if we were speaking in mid-June, things looked really good. Infection numbers were way down. Uh, vaccinations were continuing to climb. Um, I would argue that three things, two things have, have gone differently than I expected, and maybe a third. Um, so one is the Delta variant and how much more contagious it has turned out to be. Now, you could argue that maybe by eight, late April, when we knew about what Delta was doing in India, we could have predicted that, maybe. But I don't think we had quite the sense of just how uh, much more contagious it was, how, how different it was act, acting from a... Uh, population spread point of view. Um, I think that really became more apparent as we got into May and June. We started seeing uh, things in the UK, Israel, uh, elsewhere. So that's one, Delta variant and, and its impact. Second, and, and this has surprised me, and this was a source of some debate. I remember getting into a Twitter debate with Peter Hotez and Scott Gottlieb in March about how much enthusiasm was there for vaccines. And Scott Gottlieb said, you know, it's, uh, it's very deep, but not very wide, that there's a small number of people who really, really want the vaccine, but there are, there are plenty of people who really don't. And it turned out Scott was more right about this. I did not think we would be at a point where a third of American adults would basically uh, look at the last year and a half, look at the fact that we have these incredible vaccines and that are available, uh, widely available, easy to get, free, and say, no, thank you. Um, that combination of an, a lot of people unvaccinated, a super contagious variant. And then maybe the third thing is been, and again, I think this is much more preliminary and I don't think this has been quite as much of an issue, is that there is more waning immunity, more breakthrough infections. Again, it's a little tricky how we talk about it because I know Paul doesn't love the term breakthrough infections, I think for really good reason. Um, 
But let's just say that people, you know, that, that there is a, a, after about six months, you see some people not having the level of protection, at least for that initial infection, and maybe some forward transmission from that, that may be complicating this as well. And, and so put all those together, we're in a much worse situation than that where I thought we would be uh, four months ago. Uh, it's a reminder that one has to be humble about these things and that you can make prognostications, but the virus may have different plans and societies may have different plans. Um, I want to get into the winning immunity issue in a, in a couple of seconds, but um, Paul, I was wondering, you know, she should just talked about um, the Delta variant being so much more contagious. And we do hear a lot of that, but I, I'm, I'm curious if we know really how much more contagious it is because it sort of arrived at a time when we were doing our utmost to allow it to find us. You know, we were tired of COVID. We were tired of masks. We were told we didn't need them. Uh, governors were taking, um, you know, taking down all the measures that were put in place to try to keep us safe. So it was kind of a double whammy, you know, so this new variant comes along and we're just not paying it, you know, trying to evade it. Do we really know how much worse this virus is? Um, no, it's a good point. I think it is two things happening at the same time. It, it certainly, if you look at the quantity of virus that is shed from the nose and throat and compare it Delta to, to the Alpha variant, it's the first variant that came into the country, the D614G, it does appear that you are shedding more virus. And it does, at least in the stories that I've heard, it, it seems that you don't need to have as long of a contact with someone who's infected to, to become infected yourself. So I think it probably is more transmissible. But you're right. I mean, look at where we were last summer. I mean, last summer, heading into the fall, many schools remained closed, businesses remained closed, so we restricted travel. Um, you know, we were really good about masking and social distancing in school. Not true now. Remember last year the, when they, they had the bikers convention in Sturgis, South Dakota, it was all the rage. I mean, now, you know, there's 40,000 people to Phillies game. And, and, you know, it's just, it's just, we're, it's a, it, and people are having weddings and, and birthday parties, and we're just getting together much more than we did last year. So I think those two things in combination have made it hard to figure out, as, as you point out, just how much more contagious Delta is. But I think it is, I think both those things are important. One of the things I'm wondering about, you know, we still don't have a lot of answers about Delta, but it has arrived here after it's been in a couple of other places, I mean, a number, but, you know, very prominently in India, also the UK. I mean, how long do we expect this wave of, uh, you know, sharp increases of illness to last? I mean, is this our, you know, future into the fall? Would you expect these, you know, infections to sort of start to drop off uh, at a point? Uh, when people either take it more seriously or get vaccinated or it just starts to run out of hosts in places? I mean, what what is the near-term future look like? I'd like both of you to answer that, if you don't mind. Sure, so let me start. Um, short, I mean, the very short answer is we don't know, but we can look to India, we can look to the UK, we can look to Israel as three potential places we have something to learn. And by the way, we can look to what's happening in the United States as well, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, but in India, you saw this massive increase. And then in about, after about two and a half months, uh, a turnaround and starting to fall. It's often one of the sort of more simplistic things is, boy, it sort of ran through the population. I don't exactly know what that means. 70, 80% of Indians did not get infected with the Delta variant. That I'm very confident of. Um, things happen in India, like when the numbers got catastrophically bad and when hospitals ran out of oxygen, people changed their behavior in very radical ways. Cities and states went into lockdowns, things shut down. So we have to like remember that people respond to these things. Uh, they're not done in isolation. Um, UK has been interesting because UK turned at a time when things were still opening up. As I have been speaking to my friends in the UK, there's definitely a sense that with two months of rising cases, more stories about NHS hospitals starting to fill up, that there were, some, at least in some parts of the population, behavior change. Um, but the UK's sort of turning after a couple of months probably remains the most surprising to me because it, it says... Um, I don't think it's because they hit some population immunity level where you would see a sharp decline. Uh, and that really does suggest either behavior change or, or something else going on. When we look at the United States and, and you know, there's all these models of trying to estimate 
the RT, the real-time reproduction rate, um, you do see that in some of the Southern states, for instance, the RT is starting to fall and has been for the last five, seven days in Louisiana, in Arkansas, still above one, cases are still rising, but it is definitely the increase is slowing. And again, my best guess is this is behavioral response, not some population immunity. Given how contagious this variant is, we probably need a very high level of population immunity uh, to have that be the primary driver. And put it all together, Helen, and my best guess is that we're going to see a peaking of this sometime in late August into September uh, and then a decline. But that will probably vary a lot from state to state. Paul, your thoughts? Um, right. I think the two most powerful factors are population immunity induced either by natural infection, vaccination, and behavior. I mean, that's it. And that's, that's the play. I, I think that what worries me is that I, I, if, if you look at the, well, I'll take a step back. I, I think that, that clearly people who are, are naturally infected, who then are given a vaccine, will have a, a boosted response as you would expect. I think they would have a broader and longer lasting response. I do think the goal of the vaccine is to prevent moderate, severe critical disease. This is a mucosal virus. I mean, like rotavirus, like influenza. I mean, I was, I was fortunate enough to work with a team at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that created uh, the, the rotavirus vaccine, Rotatech. And the goal was to keep children out of the hospital and to keep them from dying. Um, I mean, we have dramatically, with that via vaccine, we have dramatically reduced the incidence of disease in the United States. But that vaccine didn't prevent really asymptomatic infection or even mild infection, which was also true of the natural infection. The natural infection didn't protect very well against asymptomatic or mild infection, but it did protect against moderate to severe disease. And you're generally not going to do better than what natural infection does. So I think both natural infection and, and uh, vaccination do that. Um, but again, you, 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 there is a critical percentage of the population that has neither been naturally infected nor vaccinated. And that in combination with, with the way that we're behaving right now, um, it, it's, I think you're going to see continued threat. So then the question is, is, is how, what kind of level of population immunity do you need? So if you assume that about 50% of the population is vaccinated, and you assume probably, you know, and I think it's a modest estimate that 100 million people have been infected. When they say 35 million people on CNN or MSNBC, those are people that are just tested and found to be infected. When they do antibody surveillance studies, that's off by at least a factor of three and probably more. So it's 100 million people who've been naturally infected, probably, um, you know, another 150 million, 160 million, a little more than 160 million who've been vaccinated. And those are overlapping groups. But so assume about 65 to 70 percent population immunity with, with either natural infection or immunization or both. If you look at the, the R0, the contagiousness index of this virus and the efficacy against the vaccine, it really has to be efficacy against significant shedding. Um, then I think you probably are gonna need to be in the high 80 to low 90% population immunity to truly stop spread. And, and when do we get there? I, I do think it's gonna take a while to get there. Um, I hope we don't get there by natural infection, but we get there by vaccination. And, and as Dr. Jha said, there's just a critical percentage of this population that's saying, no thanks. And, and what do you do then? And I think you, what the conversation is going to be over the next six months is compelling people to do the right thing. And that's sort of, the, on the one hand, doing the right thing public health wise, which is compelling people to get vaccinated. And on the other hand, watching this bizarre notion people have about civil liberties, where that liberty somehow includes the liberty to catch and transmit a potentially fatal infection. That's, uh, that's the fight that you're going to see. So um, I'm glad you brought up vaccine because uh, this is somewhere I wanted to go. One of the things that um, I thought last December when the first results came out of the trials, it was like a miracle. You know, so many vaccines don't, don't work out that to have a vaccine come through for a respiratory pathogen and it was 95% effective, it was like, oh my God, the gods have smiled on us. And then the second vaccine came through and it was 94% and it was like, hallelujah. Um, and, I, and that is all still true, but I kind of feel now like we've been set up a little bit because everybody thinks these vaccines are supposed to completely protect them from anything. And as we're seeing, that is not the case. You know, we were just talking about the fact that it's a respiratory pathogen. It doesn't protect the nasal mucosa. And um, consequently, there will be people who get infected. Um, let, let's talk about that. And what does that do to people's willingness to get vaccinated? I mean, 
you know, if you're already hesitant and now you're starting to hear that you could still catch COVID, does that turn people off even more? Yeah. Do you mind if I start on this? I, no, I actually <laughs> want you to start on this, Paul, because I, yes, please, 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 please. So, so you look at that Provincetown outbreak that was reported in MWR, and I think that the, the way that that story was, was presented was unfortunate, which is a nice way of saying it. I think what, what you learned from that outbreak is that of the what are roughly 346 people who were uh, men who were vaccinated and nonetheless infected, four of those people were hospitalized, which is a, a hospitalization rate of about 1.2%, which is, is, is good. I mean, that, that means the vaccine was working to keep you out of the hospital and out of the ICU and worse. Good. What the, the thing that was carried out of that, you see, we have the, the term breakthrough, I think, should be applied to people who, despite being fully vaccinated, are nonetheless hospitalized or in the ICU or die. That, that to me is a breakthrough. If we're really trying to hold this vaccine to protection against asymptomatic infection or mildly symptomatic infection, we're going to be really disappointed because it's not going to do that. I, not, and it doesn't have to. I, I think it doesn't have to do that. What, what was unfortunate about the, the, the way that this was carried, and I think it was dead wrong, was to say that despite, even if you're, even if you're fully vaccinated, and then you have an asymptomatic infection or mildly symptomatic infection, you will shed as much virus and be as contagious as someone who's not vaccinated. That is not true. And if you look carefully at that study, and especially at the discussion section that was in MMWR, they mentioned the caveat of the way they had come to that, that decision, because the way they had come to that decision was to look at at um, sort of cycle times with people with 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 the presence of genome in the upper respiratory tract. So, you know, what you really want to know is you want to know: Are you shedding infectious virus, and if so, for how long? See, this virus is weird. Uh, just as a, a nerdy virologist, I want to tell you how it's weird. It's weird because normally when you're infected with this virus, you will shed infectious virus for a week or two. You will, um, but you can be PCR positive for three months, as has been shown. And, and by PCR positive, what that means is that you're detecting viral genome, which in this case is messenger RNA. It's a positive sense, single stranded RNA virus. So you're detecting messenger RNA for three months. Now, now remember, messenger RNA is a highly labile molecule, meaning it breaks down very quickly. You have RNA spaces, meaning enzymes that break down RNA all over your body, including at your mucosal surface. So if, if that's true that RNA breaks down very quickly, then why are you positive for three months? And the reason is, is the virus continues to make genome but it doesn't continue to make whole virus. It's so-called abortive cycle of replication. I have no idea why the virus does that, but it, it is a, one of the main, one of the other sort of weird features about this virus. So, so when they did the cycle times, what they failed to do was do cycle times over time. Because if they had done that, which has been done in a study in Singapore, you find that the, the cycle time, meaning the, the longer the cycle time, the less, less in theory the less virus is there. When you look over time, people who are vaccinated We'll, we'll, sh we'll, I think, based on that study in Singapore, will shed less virus and for less, less long of a period of time. So although you can get a, a, an asymptomatic infection, mildly asymptomatic infection, you will not be as contagious as someone who was vaccinated. And it upset me that, people, that that was carried that way because some people said, well, what's the point? I mean, why get a vaccine if I'm still going to be just right. as contagious as everybody else? Forget it. And that, that was a bad message that came out of the CDC. It was really disappointing, actually. Can I, before I go to you on this one, Ashish, can I just add that, you know, that, that's a complicated kind of message, but we've known <laughs> for over a year now that some people who have had COVID, if you swab their nose, they, they test positive. That doesn't mean they actually have live virus in their nostrils. I wrote a story about a year ago about a woman who couldn't hold her baby for 12 weeks at the beginning after giving birth because she kept testing positive. She didn't have live virus in her nose. She had viral debris. We've known this is a problem. We know that sequential testing doesn't make sense after infections. So why wouldn't they have taken the extra step to make sure that this was live virus as opposed to, um, you know, an artifact that doesn't mean anything? Do we know? It's hard to grow the virus in people. That that's part of it. That's why when they do neutralization assays, they often use you know a, a pseudo typing assays, meaning they use another virus into which you clone sure. between the codes for SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. It's not even. It's not you know we've entered a new age in some ways. I mean I'm old enough to remember that in the virology lab was you would take viruses and grow them up in cell culture. You were working with infectious virus. Now it's all 
genome, which is 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 not fair. But with rotavirus and the virus that I you know, spent 25 years working on, I mean, you you will shed infectious virus in your school for five to seven days. You'll be PCR positive for six months. Hmm. You know, so because there's genomic fragments that are going to be in the school for a long period of time, it tells you nothing about your contagiousness. And I think that's what's been confusing for people here. Um. Ashish, did you want to add anything? Or? I just want to add about the province sound okay. thing. I, I think it's been um, sort of has been borderline disaster in terms of a public health message. Um, it's been so incredibly frustrating because one of the things that I've been trying to lay out is to think about the counterfactual. Imagine if province sound had happened, but none of those people were vaccinated. Yeah. Like that would have been a disaster. Now, of course, you can say people wouldn't have acted in the same way, but the point is that the vaccine, that was an incredible stress test on the vaccines. And I think the vaccines got through it with flying colors. Like, you know, look, by July 25th, before Provincetown even put in an indoor mask mandate, infections had fallen by like 80%. Like when do you get a large outbreak where basically it then just sort of trails off on its own with a super contagious virus? Oh, when population is largely vaccinated, that's when it happens. Mm -hmm. So this idea, and it's still coming out of the messaging out of the CDC, that somehow the vaccines don't stop transmission. All they do is prevent severe illness, I think is largely not true. That's not consistent with the data. And Provincetown, in my mind, was a success story that has become the scene as this horrible failure of the vaccines. And that's why everybody has to mask up now indoors. It's just been very unfortunate. And of course, there is a lot of nuance. Paul did a brilliant job explaining it. But then what you have is a lot of people who are misinformationists who will take that and then drive it home that like these vaccines don't work uh, and all of the kind of nonsense that has come out of that. So it's a very unfortunate situation. And I just think the public health messaging on this has been uh, has been not where we should have been. I want to go to questions from the audience because there are lots and a lot of them deal with children. Uh, not surprisingly, schools are starting to go in in some parts of the country or already started and soon to go in in others. Um, a number of people have asked, when will kids 5 to 11 have access to vaccine? N neither of you are on, you know, work for FDA, but um, Paul, you were on uh, the advisory committee for FDA. Do you have thoughts? Which makes me no more informed than, than <laughs> um, I, um, uh, you know, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, the, the studies were sort of in the four to 7,000 range. It looks like the FDA is asking for somewhat larger studies. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I'm reading the tea leaves just like you are. I certainly hope that we have a vaccine soon because we need it. And, and although the AAP, I know, recently wrote a letter asking the FDA to hurry up, I'm not sure that's gonna make them hurry up, but you know, you have a confluence of several events that, that bode poorly. One is, it's, as Dr. Gauss said, it's, it's the Delta variant is clearly more transmissible. You have, a, a, in children less than 12, a wholly susceptible population that is now going to be gathering together in one place as we move to fall and winter where their virus is gonna be more transmissible because it's, it's uh, cooler and less humid. And, um, and we have looser behavior. You know, the, the way we treated school children last year is going to be different than this year. And you have, you know, people, elected representatives who in many ways promote, you know, the, the, the spread of this. So I, I worry heading into, into fall and winter for, for children. I do. I, I, you know, we see in our hospital, we're certainly seeing children in our hospital now, we have uh, a handful of children, three of whom are in the ICU now. And I, I you know, it's, you know, the, the, the mantra when this virus came into this country in February of last year was, you know, this is a disease of the older person, which is true. I think 90 plus percent of people who have died are over 55. Um, and that when it infects children, it infects children less frequently and less severely, all true. But but that doesn't mean it can't infect children or that it can't affect them severely and, and it, fatally. You know, we've had more than 400 deaths in children. This approach is what we see with measles, almost all of measles every year before a vaccine. So we clearly need a vaccine. And I, I worry about spread in, uh, in, in schools heading into this winter. Okay. Um, Ashish, I was wondering, that there's a question here as well about um, what is best practice for, for schools? Uh, you know, we've talked about the fact that uh, in some states, governors have taken actions to, for instance, uh, ban or mask requirement. But, how, you know, how should parents approach this and how should schools approach yep. the gathering of children? Yeah, so there are a couple of things I think are worth thinking about for kids. And, you know, when President Biden says 
this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated, which is largely true in terms of who's really getting sick. One misunderstanding, and it's a really important part of this conversation, is people, so I have a nine-year-old. I have two teenage daughters and I have a nine-year-old son. Obviously my teenage daughters are vaccinated, my nine-year-old is not. Um, and there is a sense that a lot of people, a lot of parents have of, oh my God, the unvaccinated includes my younger kids. And so they're really in trouble. And it's worth remembering that, in fact, kids in highly vaccinated areas are much more protected because they're surrounded by people who have immunity. That's sort of how this stuff works, right? And so it's not like the random nine-year-old in a community where everybody's vaccinated is particularly at high risk. Except when you put all the nine-year-olds together, then you only need one and then boom, you've got to. So you do have to be careful about that. But the point is that one of the things we need to do to protect kids in schools is to make sure that anybody who can get a vaccine does get a vaccine, which is why recently I've been very vocal about a vaccine mandate for teachers and staff. Randy Weingart, you know, the head of the American Federation of Teachers has come out in favor of this. Uh, this to me feels like a no-brainer. Um, so I think vaccinating everybody you can is certainly one part of the strategy for kids. You know, before we talk about masks, there are other things we can do which should be less controversial. At this point in the pandemic, uh, we know that ventilation is uh, important. They've got so many tools for improving ventilation and filtration in classrooms. We should be doing that. Uh, testing is widespread available. Uh, we've had some very good success with testing in lots of schools across the country, once a week, twice a week, antigen, pooled. There are like 18 different flavors and choices, all of which can be helpful. And I think the idea that you're going to bring in a class of 25 kids and, and have no one wear a mask when everybody's vaccinated, I'm sorry, no one is vaccinated, that strikes me as irresponsible. It's just going to get you into trouble. So between all of that, like we've got the tools to get kids back into school safely. We just have to deploy them. And, you know, and I, I, I continue to be puzzled by masking in kids being as controversial as it is with a lot of just like both overhyping how important I think it's important. I don't think it's the most critical thing we could be doing. I think it's important. But at the same time, all the, like there was a Wall Street Journal op-ed basically worrying about acne and, and like, come on, we've got a, a deadly infectious pandemic that's like literally killing children, you know, thankfully not in big numbers, but still um, we've, we've got to stop the nonsense and just focus on what we know can make a difference. Speaking of things we know, one of the questioners asks, is the Delta variant more dangerous for children than previous variants or the original virus? Do we know? Can we know? Is it possible to assess that? Dr. Offit, I'd yes. love your thoughts on this. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's clearly more transmissible. Um, right. Or more people will get. It's, therefore, it's more likely that children will be infected. Therefore, because more children are infected, more children will be severely infected. So it is hard to separate those two things. I, I, I guess I'm still of the, 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 the belief that there's not clear evidence that this is a more virulent strain. It is clearly more contagious, but not clearly to be more virulent. Mm -hmm. The, the thing we talked about at the top about the fact that behaviors have changed since and, and people are less are taking fewer precautions. I mean, that's also true with kids. Kids are now doing things that more uh, are more closely approximating real life as opposed to what they were doing earlier in the pandemic, I think. Um, Can I just say one quick thing sure. on this, Helen, on the issue of virulence, which is so in the CDC um, recent report, they lay out three studies none of which are slam dunk, but all of which seems to suggest that the Delta variant may be more virulent. And I, I wanna be very careful about that. Like maybe, it's not, it's not a slam dunk, but it sort of leans towards that. And by the way, there were similar studies of that in, with the alpha variant. And I think we all feel like at the end that probably turned out not to be the case. Mm -hmm. So we don't wanna overreact. But, if, but there is a little bit of data on that. And, and you could argue it stands to reason if you have much higher viral loads in short period of time that he could have more virulence. So while the, I completely agree with Paul that the jury's out on this, uh, it, to me, it's not inconceivable that it could also end up being a little more virulent. And we have, to, we have to get better data on that, but that may be contributing to what's happening here. Okay, so one of the questioners asks if we know anything about transmission of the Delta vi variant outdoors. She says their, their local schools are maintaining mask mandates for indoors, but are not for any outdoor activities like gym class, or I guess they're doing their band and, and, and their choir outdoors as well. What do you think about outdoor 
transmission. Is it likely? Ashish, I'm going to ask that one to okay. you. Sure. So I'll start by saying my mental model for all of the variants, and, and I think it's also true for Delta, is um, that outdoor transmission can happen, but under really unusual circumstances, meaning most outdoor activities should be relatively safe, even without a mask. You know, yes, choir singing and could be, uh, super packed concerts could be, political rallies we think have contributed to, to, to outbreaks because you have large numbers of people stationary together, uh, often with speaking and yelling and things that cause more virus uh, to be expelled. When you're in those kinds of situations, it can be. So if you wanna have an outdoor concert, you can make it safe by doing a, a good amount of spacing. I don't know that um, most normal outdoor activities, for instance, like things like playing soccer and stuff on, I, I just, it's hard for me to imagine that there's been any transmission because kids were playing soccer together, even if they like bunch up together, which young kids can do. Okay. Paul, do you agree with that? Yeah, that completely. I'm just, you know, and soccer is a perfect example, right? You're running around and running around and running around. You don't have really that kind of close face-to-face -face contact running for a long period of time. Um, in theory, um, I think, you know, if you really want to avoid all risk, you know, don't, don't leave your home. But I think the minute you walk outside, the best you can do is to try and mitigate lessen risk. You're never going to eliminate it. And that's something people have to get used to. Uh, another one of our viewers is asking um, whether or not you would feel safe eating indoors at a restaurant at this point. I'd like both of your takes. Yeah, no, I'll tell you, I, I know is the answer to that question. I mean, ago, I just took our daughter and her fiance up to Ithaca because he was getting his MBA at Cornell. And, um, you know, so we walked into restaurants and we walked into restaurants with a mask on. And this, you know, Ithaca was, was great at masking. I mean, everybody was masked, many outdoors. And um, still, I felt better with a mask when I walked in. And when I sat down, it was the four of us at the table. I felt obviously more comfortable. And but I only felt comfortable with the when the uh, waiter or waitress came over that they that they were masked. Right? Because I, as long as I'm indoors, I just don't trust it. But you can't yeah. really eat with a mask on. No, no. I say take the mask off. Please. <laughs> Otherwise, it's messy. Um, I so I did indoor dining for the first time since the pandemic in May. And I felt pretty comfortable doing that in May. Um, and probably I'd say maybe three or four times I ate indoors between around May into early June. Um, part of it was infection numbers in Massachusetts where I live in Rhode Island where I work were incredibly low, less than one in a hundred thousand per day. And, uh, and I was fully vaccinated and Delta wasn't a th much of a thing. And I just thought this is pretty safe. And I think it was. Um, at this point, no. At this point, I do eat out and it's always outside. And that, and I feel very comfortable eating outside right now. I wouldn't eat indoors right now. Uh, somebody asked, how should healthy vaccinated young adults in their 20s be living now? Are bars irresponsible? Is there a safe way to socialize? Or has Delta totally changed the calculus? Yeah, I think Delta's changed the calculus. I mean, it, you know, uh, it, I think that, that 20 somethings who walk into a bar, um, knowing that they're gonna drink, knowing that they're not gonna be masked, knowing that there are definitely gonna be people who are unmasked in that bar who are, who are unvaccinated, knowing that this Delta virus is contagious and, and highly contagious and that, that this country is still suffering, you know, at sometimes more than 100,000 cases a day and sometimes as many as 500, 600 deaths a day, I think it's irresponsible, which is why I think that, that hopefully bars and restaurants will do what is being done in other countries, which is have a vaccine certificate to say that everybody who's in this bar with you is vaccinated. That would make me feel better. What yeah, do you think the likelihood of that is though? San Francisco's working on that, right? Wasn't there a coalition of bars in San Francisco that were gonna do that? But I, I think the broader point is, and this is one where I don't know if I, I don't know if I disagree with Paul, but I, I, I have a, maybe a slightly I don't know. I'll just say what my take is and we, you can just decide whether I disagree or not. Um, look, if you're a young, healthy person in your 20s and you don't live with an elderly person or an unvaccinated young person um, and you're fully vaccinated and you're not in Louisiana where the infection numbers are horrible, you could make, I think, a reasonable calculus that you're going to go into a bar and you're going to hang out with a couple of friends who are vaccinated. But yes, there may be other unvaccinated people. Yes, you have some risk of having a breakthrough infection. It's going to most likely be mild. Uh, you're a young, healthy person and you'll do okay. That's a calculation that people could make and I don't think that would be unreasonable, but there's a whole lot of ifs there. And if you're comfortable and you understand that that's the risk you're facing, I, I, I would say, I get that. 
Um, but it is for, for, for me, for instance, I have a, I do have an unvaccinated child at home. I, I'd rather, and I, you know, I'm not so young and I'd rather not have a breakthrough infection. So, uh, even, you know, or, or just, uh, so I, I think there's plenty of reasons why different people can take this a bit differently. Um, but it's, it's tricky to figure out where it's safe to, to be doing all that indoor stuff right now. Speaking of indoor stuff, <laughs> One of the things we haven't been doing a lot is working indoors with one another over the past uh, almost, well, over 18 months now. Um, one of the questioners wants to know, you know, some companies have been talking about calling workers back, you know, in September. Certainly, I know the one I work for, the big reopening was meant to be after Labor Day, although it's been pushed back. What do you think of the notion of people going back into workplaces en masse at this point? Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's fine as long as we have a vaccine mandate. I think everybody who's gonna to get together in a, in a closed space indoors should be vaccinated. You know, it's not, this is, you're not asking them to get a heart transplant. You're just asking <laughs> them to get two shots of the vaccine. It's not that, doesn't hurt. It, it provides excellent protection, certainly against severe critical disease, um, why would, there's no good reason not to do it. Assuming you don't have a medical condition to preclude your getting vaccinated, um, there's no reason that you, 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 you can, you, there's no reasonable way to make that choice that you shouldn't get vaccinated. All the reasons people give are bad ones. Right. Yeah. And I will say, so we have a vaccine mandate at our university that we, that our president uh, put in, I don't know, three, four months ago, she made it clear that by July one, everybody had to have the second shot in place. And we're gonna have everybody back. The big debate we had was, I think that, and this is again, the province town outbreak caused a lot of consternation, a lot of concerns. And so we have decided for now to ask people to continue masking indoors um, through the end of September. But you could make the case that in Rhode Island where the infection numbers are rising, but they're not horrible. Uh, if, if you're in a, in a room full of all vaccinated people, it's not really clear that you need to be wearing a mask, but it's also not unreasonable and for a short period of time. And, and so th that's a decision. But I think it's very doable to bring people back to work safely. Uh, certainly, if you have a I, I would not do it if, if, a, if a third of the people were not vaccinated. I just wouldn't think that's a good idea. But if everybody's vaccinated, I think it's pretty safe. Right. And um, early on, you know, there was discussion about vaccine mandates and uh, the thinking seemed to be that while these vaccines are not fully licensed while they're under they're being used under emergency use authorizations that you couldn't really require people legally to 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 be vaccinated but recently I, I, with the arrival of delta there's just been sort of this cascade of companies and and institutions announcing that you know no vaccine no no access um has it been decided that these will stand up? Yeah, my understanding from at least the legal opinions I've read on this is that there is that that you can mandate vaccines under emergency use authorization. You don't have to wait for full approval. So, and, and that's happened. We pay the Penn Health system um, mandated vaccines months ago, um, and we're comfortable doing that. And the person who took the lead in that, this uh, physician named B.J. Brennan, and I had a fairly long talk about what does it mean to do that legally and. And it doesn't seem to have been a problem. And the courts have ruled on this, right? The courts have been fine with it, both in, in the Indiana case, the Houston Methodist case, and all the legal scholars, again, that I've been speaking to all say this is not going to be a hindrance. Um, I do think that, that psychologically it's a barrier for many companies. And one of the reasons I feel like a full approval would be really helpful from the FDA. Uh, but from a, from a legal point of view, it seems like it's fine. One and of the questions, oh, sorry, sorry go ahead. Thing. It's interesting when people will say, and I think it's a straw man argument. I, I think we even once fully approved, there are people who've been using this as a reason not to get it that still won't get it. But, but you know, think about it. It's, it's you know, the, the, technically when the FDA approves something through emergency use authorization, what they're saying is that the company is allowed to distribute an investigation of the drug. That's what DUA is. Um, obviously a licensed product is, is, is different, but you know, it's not like this is an experimental product that's been given to half of the American population of an enormous safety and efficacy portfolio on these vaccines. I mean, more than most licensed products that are out there. So mm. it's, a, it's a straw man argument. It's, it's more, as I think Dr. Josh said earlier, it's more psychological than anything else. Uh, one of the viewers is asking, should, you know, in the face of the, the spread of the Delta variant, 
should people who receive the one dose J and J get a booster shot or get another vaccination? I, I'm a little hesitant to term, term it as a booster because um, the terminology is a little bit difficult, but should they have more protection on board? So, so I, let me tackle this if you don't mind. I, I think we will cross the line where we know we need a booster dose when people who are vaccinated, fully vaccinated, nonetheless are hospitalized when they ask you to a doctor. That, that's when the line gets crossed for me. Mm -hmm. um, we're not there yet. We're not. And I, I hopefully the CDC is carefully looking at these data because that's what you need to know. Also realize as so so we're not so I think the short answer to that question is no. Whether you've gotten two doses of the mRNA vaccines or one dose of the J and J vaccine, which has become a thing. I think San Francisco has moved forward on giving a booster dose for people who've gotten a single dose of the J and J vaccine. But there I, I don't see any evidence that you need to do that. And you know, this discussion of boosters is just a little off the point. The problem in this country is not boosting people who've already been vaccinated. The problem in this country is vaccinating people who haven't been vaccinated. That's where we need to focus our efforts, all our efforts, I feel. Yeah, Ashish, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think I think Paul's exactly right. I mean, uh, I can't remember the number. I think about 13 million have gotten J&J, &J, somewhere in the 10, 13 million. It's, it's a small number, but it's not a trivial number. And in, in all the data that I've been looking at from individual states about breakthrough infections, I've been looking at what we know about the vaccines people got we're not seeing some massive disproportionate number of J&J &J, uh, recipients. We're not seeing a lot of J&J &J recipients ending up in the hospital at much, much higher rates. If that was happening, I would be very concerned as well. And I would say we have a problem here, people. We got to do something. So my advice, I have a lot of friends and colleagues who are reaching out. I'm sure Paul's inbox is even more inundated than mine on this. of like, what should I do? What should I do? And I basically am like, hold. And let's just see where the data goes. And it may be that you need a second shot. And I think that's entirely possible. Uh, but I think we're going to have more data in the upcoming weeks. Not We're not talking about many, many months of waiting. Uh, I'm hopeful that we'll see the data on, this, on the two-shot J&J &J vaccine trials sometime in the next month. That's my guess. I don't have any insight on exactly when we'll see that data. So I think there's more coming on this. And what I recommend to people is I say, you think you have terrific protection against severe disease. I don't know if you have the same level of protection against uh, mild disease. You might, you might not, I would hold. You know, one of the things, there's been so much talk lately about, you know, maybe people should have a third shot you know, not as a booster, but as part of the primary series that we should have been vaccinated with three shots, not two, if you got the mRNA vaccines. Um, I find it kind of puzzling because, you know, the data on the mRNA vaccines still looks terrific. You know, if you're talking about, like if last year this time, if anybody would have told any of us that these vaccines would have had protection in the 80%, you know, 80% VE, we'd all have been sh popping champagne corks. Uh, you know, these are still working and potentially better than like the J&J &J and, and the AstraZeneca so vaccine. So um, where is this really big push for boosters coming from? Like part of it is watching Israel and Israel is now doing it for people over 60. And we've, you know, we've sort of admired Israel's approach to vaccinations. They were super fast and they got a lot done. There's some data um, that suggests that, you know, as you know, beyond six months, there's uh, the kind of uh, vaccine efficacy does seem to decline a little bit. And for me, the one place I have been concerned and have to policymakers have been saying, you may wanna be ready for a third shot is in congregate care settings, nursing homes, where those individuals got vaccinated six, seven months ago now. And 40% uh, and of nursing home workers are unvaccinated and Delta is a problem. And first of all, you wanna get those nursing home workers vaccinated, but, um, but you may, it may be reasonable to say in that one or 2 million people who are so high risk, um, giving them a third shot may be useful, but I'm using a lot of maybes and you might want to think about, uh, I'd want more data to guide that. But I think that's one area where I can imagine that being reasonable. Paul, do you have a thought? I mean, I, I guess we'll see how this plays out. I remain confident that, that these vaccines are 
highly effective at preventing severe critical disease. So, and that continues to be true. It continues to be true with the first variant, the first big different, the first variant D six Q G, then the alpha variant now the delta variant. So, and I think that's I also predict that that is going to work out the same over the lambda variant. Um, we'll see how that plays out. But I'm I, I'm amazed by these vaccines. I mean, no one would have predicted this. I mean, when our our FDA vaccine advisory committee met. Um, you know, we basically were instructed if you can have at least 50% vaccine efficacy, then we could, you know, we could move forward with these products. And you have, as you noticed, with the first two vaccines, 94, 95% efficacy. And, it, and when, the, when it was done in the real world, where you didn't have a highly controlled situation, it remained highly effective. So, and it remains highly effective. That outbreak in Providence now shows you it's still a highly effective vaccine. Um, we should be celebrating. Of course, it doesn't work if you don't get it. it it's a uh, it's, it's not like the concept of vaccination is good enough. You actually have to get vaccinated. Right. Um, some people have gotten vaccinated and haven't gotten the kind of take that you would have wanted. I'm mean, talking here about people with, um, you know, some severe and autoimmune disorders or um, in compromised immune systems because they're on you know, cancer therapy or whatever. Um, one of the viewers is saying that, you know, waiting for the, chance to get a third shot is wearing her down. When is this likely to be given? I think we're on the verge of hearing something about this pretty soon, don't you think? Friday. The ACIP Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, which is an advisory committee to the CDC, is meeting on Friday to talk about boosting the booster doses for immune compromised hosts. But, you know, immune compromise entails a large spectrum from people who are very immune compromised, like say a bone marrow transplant patient, or some solid organ transplant patients, or as compared to people who are getting um, chemotherapeutic like drugs for their rheumatoid arthritis or biological agents for their multiple sclerosis. So it really, it really depends. I think to me, what that group represents, and hopefully this is going to be brought up at Friday's meeting, is they're the group that depends on the herd. I mean, when, when the, the worst thing an anti-vaccine person says to me is when they say, what do you care what I do? You're vaccinated which makes two incorrect assumptions. One, that vaccines are 100% effective, which is true of no vaccine, and two, that everybody can get vaccinated when they can't. There are people that depend on the herd. And right now, those, those groups include the hundreds of thousands of people who fall into the immune compromised category and children less than 12 who also can't be vaccinated. Ashish? I really have nothing to add. Completely right. And I, I think I understand people's anxiety and I, I actually have colleagues, not colleagues, but, but friends, family friends who are like just wanting to go out and get the shots. And I totally understand how they're feeling. And um, I, we are moving on this. I think we're going to have a lot more clarity on immunocompromised. And as Paul said, uh, immunocompromised varies so much. You really need to be talking to your rheumatologist, to your oncologist, to your specialist about, about thinking through this as well. So you want a little guidance on this and not just set up another appointment with CVS. So several of the people who are watching are asking questions about travel. You know, is it safe to travel now? Should people be restricting travel now? Should people be restricting tra travel to parts of the country or parts of the world where, you know, uh, the outbreak is raging? Thoughts? I turn to a shoe for this. Yeah, well, I would just say, I mean, when, when you cross 100,000 infections a day, um, and a lot of people getting sick. I, I, I sort of make two points about travel. Um, you know, obviously you're exposing yourself to more risk. I mean, it also depends, by the way, on, on how you travel. You want to get into a car with your family and go to a rental house? That's fine. That's really low risk, and you're in, in probably in a function. But we're thinking about like getting on an airplane. Planes themselves are reasonably safe, but airports, all the other interactions, and and the other, and so there is that risk. But also, you know, like. The city of Austin right now says that they have, what, about a dozen ICU beds that are free or, or less. Um, one of the things that happens, I always sort of say to people, is like, you may be fully vaccinated, but the vaccines are terrific, but they don't prevent you from getting into a car accident. Uh, they don't prevent you from having a heart attack or a stroke. Turns out we need a healthcare system for many, many other things beyond COVID. And so if you can avoid the hot zones where hospitals are really um, full, that's a good thing to do. And so I think unnecessary travel should be curtailed. I don't think everybody needs to stay at home, but I, I think people should be thoughtful about it and try to avoid areas where hospitals are really stretched. Uh, somebody asks if, um, if 
do we know whether or not um, people who've been vaccinated and go on to be infected are equally susceptible to develop long COVID? Also, you know, are, do they lose the sense of smell and taste to the same sort of degree as, as unvaccinated people? Do we know about this? We know a little. Okay. Right, Paul, do you want to? No, no, back, first? Back. no. So there's a New England Journal study from two, three weeks ago, somewhere in the last month, um, looking at, uh, at breakthrough infections. I think it was in healthcare workers in Israel, but I can't remember, but I think that's what it was. And um, so first of all, I think there is pretty good data. People can lose their sense of smell and taste. Um, that is one of the features of a breakthrough infection. Um, in that study, a, a high proportion of people still had some symptoms six weeks out. Um, but, you know, depends a lot on what you're going to call long COVID. Some amount of post-viral symptoms can persist from lots of viruses for weeks or, or months. Um, you know, there, there's this sort of more classic long COVID that is much more immunologic, whether it's due to viral reservoirs or autoimmunity. Most of the data I have seen and most of the experts I've been speaking to um, who think a lot about immun immunity uh, suggest to me at least that the immunologic training you get from vaccines should make you much less susceptible to that long COVID. Don't know for sure. And so my best guess is that you probably are much less susceptible to long COVID, but I, I, I'm sure it's not hundred percent. And uh, I'm really curious what Dr. Offit has to say. Yeah, no, no, I, I think we need more information, right? The, the, um, that study in Israel was relatively small. I think it was something like seven people went on to develop longer term symptoms, even though they'd been vaccinated, but then became mildly infected, which represented like 19% or something of that group. So, so we, I think those numbers are small. We, we need more information. I think that it makes sense that if you're vaccinated um, that, that, and then you're exposed to the virus, that the virus will probably not replicate as well in you as someone, somebody who's not vaccinated, therefore less likely to cause the things that are associated with long COVID, which I'm sure at least in part are a vasculitis, so we'll see. Um, one of the questioners asked sort of the $64 billion question, you know, if, if, if we are where we are now, it kind of feels like vaccination isn't the entire off ramp that we thought it would be. What, what can we sort of expect going into the fall and the winter? Um, you know, how, and how much longer are, do you expect the acute phase of this pandemic to continue, at least in the United States? See, I, also, I think vaccines are the offering, okay. but however, they don't work if you don't get them. I, I think if you look at countries that have high vaccine rates, much higher than ours, they're doing better than we are. I do think the challenge is going to be, given that there's 195 countries in this world, given that many have not given a single dose of vaccine, um, I think we are going to need to have a highly immune population for years to come. And that is going to be a challenge. But I do think that that is a way to dramatically reduce the spread of this virus in this country. We just haven't gotten there yet. And it's, that's, that's the frustration for me. This is the golden ticket and people just seem to not want to take it. And, and I will say that while we're getting there, there are mitigation efforts that we can make that will help. I mean, you know, I think um, things like, so even, you know, even uh, at our university where vaccine mandates for everybody, but, but I think I'm, I'm going to get the number wrong, but it's like, you know, one or 2% of the of folks have asked for an exemption. So we're going to have a few, you know, people have to, I think having some amount of ongoing testing to making sure that we're not missing a lot of uh, infections, um, improving air quality indoors, improving filtration and, and, um, and, and ventilation. I think there are those kinds of things that may be long-term things where we just improve the kind of background uh, susceptibility in some important ways. Um, when we get a groom of 50 people or 100 people together, my guess is maybe for a little while, everybody will be wearing masks in those contexts because it's just better. And so I think that some of this stuff is gonna stick with us for a little while longer uh, until we get to 90, 90% population immunity at which point a lot of this can be pulled back. How long do you think it's gonna take us to get there? Well, I have a similar 65, 70% mental model of like where we are right now. And so adding, so first of all, getting kids under 12 will help a lot because 
it, there's a there's a chunk of them. Um, and, you know, and if we get a lot of them vaccinated, I think some of these vaccine mandates are really going to cause a lot of upticks. I, I think the biggest question in my mind is the large employers. And I've been speaking to a bunch of them. And I think they are coming to realize they're not getting people back into the office unless they vac- do a vaccine mandate. There is no way you're going to have a packed office. There's no way you're going to have a conference room with 20 people sitting around a large conference table if half the people are unvaccinated. It's just, that's not a thing. It's not going to work. Not for any extended period of time. And as companies begin to realize that, I think more mandates are coming. And so I am optimistic that uh, we are going to get, uh, you know, a lot more uh, population immunity in the next two, three months, four months. But it's going to be, it's going to be a slog. Can I just slip in as a last question, something that I am very concerned about? You know, you just talked about the fact that, I mean, this is not a pandemic that's occurring in the United States, pandemic around the world. And while the world remains unvaccinated, the emergence of something, you know, that is beyond Delta potentially could, I mean, certainly there will be more mutations and variants emerge and, and something potentially worse than Delta could come along. Um, can we talk a, for a second about global vaccine equity and what role the United States could play there? I look to Dr. Jaffe as a public health expert. <laughs> I'm happy to start. I'm, I'm also interested in your opinion, Dr. Offit. But look, um, booster issues aside, um, we have a lot of vaccines in our country. Uh, you know, we just have a massive amount. And, and we're so- buying more. <laughs> What's that? And we're buying more. We're buying more. And we are at a point right now where we are wasting a lot. You know, we're throwing hundreds of thousands of doses, soon millions of doses out. Um, it's a problem. And I get, and I have been, I've gotten into some fights with some friends in the administration about how they're managing this. And I get their point. I've gotten beaten up when I have said, like, I can't believe we have, you know, 70, 80 million doses sitting out on shelves and you know where we are globally. And they're like, you can't pick up the ones from CVS and send it to India. I get that. Um, but we gotta do a better job of managing this incredibly precious resource. And we've gotta send, a, we've gotta share a lot more of these vaccines. And there is a reasonable discussion about, you know, how much do we just let other countries buy versus do we buy them and, and share them? But the key issue is we gotta get a lot more of this stuff out. COVAX is one mechanism, it need not be the only one. I think the African continent is the one I'm particularly worried about because vaccination rates are so horrendously low. Uh, Africa CDC should be our partner. Um, they are fabulous at vaccine, at everything on, on the public health front on the, on the continent. Um, but I just do not feel like this is rising to the level of priority that it needs to in the administration. I appreciate that politics, and I don't mean this in a bad way, necessitates a focus on the domestic population. I totally get that. That's right and reasonable. But um, we have to have a much bigger, more aggressive global stance, not just on sharing, but also on production and, and, and all the other things that need to come to this. Paul, do you want to add a last word? You know, last word is it's not it's not an altruistic act. It, it's uh, it's something that needs to happen for us too. I mean, you know, we it's, if you look at the Delta variant, where did the Delta variant come from? Came from, came from India. Um, the alpha variant, you know, it's initially at least identified in the UK. The, the, you know, what happens in other countries affects you. We still vaccinate our children with polio vaccine every year, even though we haven't had a case of natural polio in this country since the late 1970s. We do it because polio still exists in the world. And in that case, it's really only endemic in two countries. So um, it, I, we have a long way to go here. But I, I think as a as a technologically advanced and economically advanced country, it, we, we owe it to the rest of the world to supply vaccine. So I'm afraid this is the end of our time. Uh, it's been fascinating to have the opportunity to ask you two these questions. And um, I wish we could go on for longer, but I do think um, I'm going to have to close this off. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Brown University School of Public Health for um, hosting this event and um, stay safe, folks. And thank, thank you, Paul and Helen. This was a pleasure. Be well, everybody.